And uh, so I'm going to talk about work uh, which was um, which grew out, grew out of work originally with Strom Borman, which was announced several years ago, but uh, there were have obviously been delays writing it up. Um, and I apologize for my part in that situation. Um, and more recently, <laughs> Umut uh, Varulgunas um, asked what the story was and if he could help us uh, initially without even asking to be a co-author or anything, being very generous. Um, but, uh, you know, we uh, went through what we had and he immediately found a serious mistake and explained to us how to fix it. And um, we're now close to having it having a, a finished story, which is what I'll present here. And um, yeah, so I, I really want to emphasize that uh, the, the shape of the results has really been strongly influenced by, by Umut. Um, and, uh, and also mention that he's on the job market. <laughs> um, okay, so let me start. So, Here's the, here's what we're, we're aiming for. I'll, I'll say what, what, what we kind of hope for before saying what we, in what sense we prove it. So we're, we're assuming we've got a compact symplectic manifold X and some symplectic normal crossings divisor D inside it. And it's natural to conjecture that the flow cohomology of X is some deformation of the symplectic cohomology of the complement of the divisor. Um, and that as a result, I mean, anytime you have a, a deformation of a chain complex, there's an induced spectral sequence from the resulting filtered complex. And an addition to the conjecture is that spectral sequence converges to the flow cohomology. So that's, that's the shape that the spectral sequence would, would have. And the, the reason you would make such a conjecture is very natural. That uh, choose some Hamiltonian for computing Fleur cohomology of X, which goes up near the divisor D. So, so in this picture, S is the skeleton, D is the divisor. And this, this sort of along the bottom is, is meant to be X and up is the, we're like drawing the graph of H. Uh, so by choosing a Hamiltonian of this shape, uh, if we manage to somehow forget about the orbits that live on D, then what's left looks like a copy of the symplectic cohomology of x minus d, but with a differential that now doesn't just count cylinders inside x minus d, it also counts cylinders passing through the divisor d. Um, so, 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 you know, I put some qualifiers in the conjecture. In, in red, I say that Flow cohomology should be a deformation in a sense. And the in a sense refers to the fact that we actually need to throw out these orbits on D, which contribute to the uh, a priori contribute to the flow cohomology. So we, we need some kind of modified version of what it means to be a deformation to, to deal with the fact that those orbits are there. And, uh, and the second qualifier I put is that sometimes this should hold. Um, so there, there are some, clearly some hypotheses needed for this result to hold as stated, because there's an obvious counterexample um, as well understood that if you take X to be projective space and D to be a hypersurface, then the symplectic cohomology is just the symplectic cohomology of C to the N, which vanishes. So there's no way we're going to have a spectral sequence from something 
from zero leading to the Fleur cohomology of CPN, if that is non-zero. And, and you can generalize this, uh, this example if you take a union of uh, up to n divisors in CPN, then you still have vanishing symplectic cohomology because it's a product of C to the uh, n, you know, so some number of copies of C with some number of copies of C star. Okay. So there are these uh, these two qualifications to the, the picture that we need to deal with. So first I'm going to right, tell you tell you about the uh, what the sometimes is. Actually, maybe let me let me let me draw that. So this this is about this, and now I'm going to say what. When, when, what does sometimes mean? Okay. So here, here are the hypotheses under which we managed to prove a version of this conjecture. Uh, the first hypothesis is a very familiar one. It says that the symplectic manifold should be um, non-negatively monotone. Uh, the second hypothesis is also a fairly uh, standard one. It says that uh, if di are the irreducible components of our normal crossings divisor, then we can express the cohomology class of our symplectic form as Poincaré dual of some combination of the components di with all positive coefficients. Um, we, we actually also assume lambda i are integers, but that's, I mean, we probably don't need to, it just makes some things convenient. So I'm, I'm not going to draw attention to that. Um, and finally, uh, the third bit of the hypothesis is the less familiar one. It says that kappa lambda i should be at most one for all i. So for example, you can uh, see how this third hypothesis rules out the, the counter example. Um, so if D is a union of N hyperplanes in, or capital N hyperplanes in CPN, then you can show that n plus one is the sum of the kappa lambda i. So if all of those are less than or equal to one, that's less than or equal to capital N. And so this exactly rules out the, the counter example that I gave just above. And so you can see some kind of sharpness of this third hypothesis. Okay, so before uh, proceeding with the precise statement of the theorem, let me give you some context for these hypotheses. So let me first tell you what they mean in terms of algebraic geometry. So here we suppose that X is a projective variety, D is an actual divisor, omega is actually a Kähler form. Then this, this first hypothesis of uh, non-negative monotonicity uh, is really saying that the Kodaira dimension of X is non-positive. So it's saying, roughly it's saying X is Fano or Kalabi Yau. Um, the second hypothesis about the cohomology class of the symplectic form being a, a positive combination of the Poincaré joules of the divisor components. That tells us that the complement of D is affine. So it's basically saying that D supports an effective ample divisor. So when we remove an ample divisor, we, we end up with an affine variety. And then this uh, slightly stranger third hypothesis, 
kappa lambda i being at most one, uh, that should really be thought about as a hypothesis about the log Hedera dimension of this affine variety. It's saying that it's non-negative. So it's saying that the affine variety x minus d is log Calabi Yau or log general type. So, so here's another way of thinking about these hypothesis, hypotheses. Hypothesis one is saying that the uh, canonical divisor is sort of negative or non-positive. Non and this hypothesis three is saying that the canonical divisor is greater than or equal to minus d in some sense. I mean, I mean greater than or equal to means the difference is um, uh, has a positive Kodaira dimension in, in the generalized sense, <clears throat> in the sense of, 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 of Kodaira dimension of a, a line model. Okay, so so, they, so it turns out that these are natural hypotheses in terms of algebraic geometry. And they're also natural in terms of symplectic geometry. Um, and this is closer to how they enter into our work. So in terms of symplectic geometry, this first hypothesis of non-negative monotonicity implies that the Novikov ring over which Fleur cohomology is defined uh, is non-negatively graded. Um, the second hypothesis uh, basically implies that uh, we can, well, it, it, it tells us how to equip this complement of the divisor, x minus d, with a primitive for the symplectic form, which makes that complement into a Louisville manifold. So, so somehow the, the, the first bit, the, the fact that the restriction of omega to x minus d is exact um, is, I mean, it's, it's I mean, that, that's may, maybe straightforward to see, but the, the, this condition on the lambda i being positive is, is what gives us that the resulting exact symplectic manifold is, is convex at infinity. Um, and for, for my purposes later, I, I want to emphasize that actually it, it actually gives us slightly more than just saying that there admit exists a Louisville structure on the complement. Uh, it also specifies for us a class of primitives, theta lambda. So where the pair of omega and theta lambda defines a class in relative Durham cohomology. And we can choose this, this class, choose theta lambda so that this is this class is equal to the Poincare dual of the lambda as I defined it before, this sum of lambda i di. So, so lambda actually determines for us this Louisville one form theta or puts a restriction on this theta lambda. And finally, this third hypothesis says that we can equip symplectic cohomology with a grading that makes it non-negatively graded. And this is with, with respect to a trivialization of the um, canonical bundle of X minus D, which is induced by, by this lambda. So, so the, the lambda determines the grading uh, with respect to which our symplectic cohomology is non-negatively graded. Okay, so um, does anyone ha have any questions about the hypotheses? Um, okay. All right, le so let me, um, it, it, it could 
I could deceive you if I if I don't put this this slide just clarifying my convention. So so every complex we're going to talk about is Q graded. And whenever I talk about taking a completion, I mean taking a completion in the graded sense, which means we take the completion of each graded piece and then take their direct sum. So for example, can I is there a question? You can I ask it a question? So you said the symplectic cohomology was uh, positively graded or non-negatively graded? Yes. But that, I thought that was something that held for gen, things of general type rather than uh, phenol. Like that's that's correct. So so the the hypothesis is that the log Kadira dimension of uh -huh. x minus d is non-negative. So so x minus d is a, is log Kalabi Yao or log general type. Okay. All right, so as an example of this uh, completion convention, if we take the Novikov ring, which we'll just take to be Laurent polynomials in variable Q in degree two kappa, well, we need to take this graded completion of it, but unless kappa equals zero, every monomial Q to the I is in a different degree so these graded pieces just have rank one. So it's a completion does nothing to them. So it's only if Q equal, if kappa equals zero that we ended up taking, um, having some infinite sums in our Novikov ring. Okay, so a, a deformation of a cochain complex over lambda is a differential uh, del plus delta on the completed tensor, graded completed tensor product, such that delta is small with respect to the Q-adic filtration. So it increases Q degree. And the result, there's a resulting spectral sequence uh, corresponding to this filtered complex. Uh, that's what the E1 page looks like. It's given by cohomology of C, tensored with the associated graded of the Novikov ring. And uh, in general, we need extra hypotheses to conclude that it converges. But like the bounded below, boundedness below of the filtration, cubatic filtration. Okay, and we're also going to need um, the degree truncation of a complex, which is the which just means the stupid truncation where you just only keep things in degree less than or equal to p. Sorry, I think this was, we're actually gonna use strictly less than, yeah. Okay. So now here's the, the result. It's a little bit uglier uh, than you might hope, um, which is mainly to do with the, the procedure we use to throw out orbits on D on the divisor. Uh, so, so this is, so, so in the case kappa equals zero, um, parts A and B of this theorem uh, are really uh, known due to work of McLean and, and some but the case kappa positive is, uh, is new. Right, so, so what, does the, what, what, what do we get under these hypotheses one to three? Well, we have a, a filtration F by quasi-isomorphic subcomplexes. So we're just, just replacing this tensor product of symplectic cochains with the Novikov ring by, um, you know, we've got some, some bunch of copies of something quasi-isomorphic and they define a filtration. And then we have a system of 
deformations of the degree truncations of the, the pieces of this filtration. All right. So, so this basically, given such a filtration, we always get a, a system of cochain complexes like this. And what we're saying is that we have deformations of each of the cochain complexes, which are respected by the maps in this system. And in the region where we have not truncated, so away from where we've truncated the, de the, the degrees, the cohomology of these deformations is exactly the Fleur cohomology of X. So, what I want you to what I want you to think is is um, like to, what I wish is that we could just kind of I mean th these these things here that we're putting here are, are really just there to um, throw out the uh, the orbits on D in a kind of in a way that's harmless to the cohomology. So it looks confusing, but what this is, is, is just the way we make precise the procedure of throwing out orbits on D. So the, if we didn't have to bother with that, then we would just have SC contensor, completed tensor product with lambda, and we would just have one deformation delta, and that would be it. But in reality, we need to have this system of deformations, delta P. Uh, one might hope that we could make a kind of cleaner statement using homological perturbation theory, but we haven't succeeded in doing that yet. All right, so uh, as a consequence of this part A of the theorem, which is the one that I want you to think of as saying that Fleur cohomology is a deformation of symplectic cohomology. So as a consequence, we get the kind of spectral sequence that we wanted. So basically the idea is we've now got this system of uh, deformations of deformed complexes. So each one individually gives us a spectral sequence and this system of spectral sequences stabilizes. Like each, each entry in, in our system of spectral sequences stabilizes as P goes to infinity. So we can take some kind of limit and we get just one spectral sequence. And it behaves as we want it to. The E1 page is just given by symplectic cohomology. And under the assumption that kappa is positive, it converges to the flow cohomology. And we uh, didn't quite yet succeed in proving the case kappa equals zero, but it, this seems to have been done anyway, in any case by McLean and Sun, um, perhaps in a different way. Um, okay, so those are parts A and D of the, the theorem. We get a deformation, and as a result, we get a spectral sequence. And part C says that we can identify the differential on the E1 page of our spectral sequence as the, the Lie bracket with certain class in symplectic cohomology, which counts caps passing through the divisor. And th this requires an, an extra restriction, an extra hypothesis to rule out sphere bubbling in the divisor. It's always satisfied if kappa is positive. Um, so, so the definition of this class beta can be found in um, Ganatra Pomoliano's uh, log PSS method. Okay. Nick, can you remind me what um, the what kappa was again? I've forgotten. Kappa is the constant of monotonicity. Um, so, so this. Uh, Like this. Oh, I see. So if, if um, kappa was zero, then that would mean C1 was zero. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. So it's it's the case um, 
it's the case C1 equals zero that we haven't succeeded in proving convergence of our spectral sequence for the cohomology and also where one actually needs an additional hypothesis to deal with sphere bubbling inside the divisor D in this, in this part C where we identify the differential on the E1 page. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Do you have a product in this statement, or, or this is just the linear spaces? Uh, we ha we are only doing it for linear spaces, but um, the, one one should fully expect that everything we do is compatible with product structures. I see. Thank you. Yeah, I, maybe perhaps it's a good point here to mention uh, what the original intention was that was announced um, several years ago with with Strom, which uh, which was that we we actually wanted to get a more precise uh, description of this deformation delta p as corresponding to a certain Mora Kartan element for the L infinity structure on the symplectic co-chains, uh, on the symplectic cohomology. Um, so, so this part C is somehow a, a, a leading order bit of that more refined statement, which we still um, believed to be true and, and would be a very nice result to have, but we have, um, and, and we believe we have a way to prove it, but uh, this is not what we decided to try to finish writing up. That makes sense. Um, okay. And, and, and that's relevant because, uh, to, to your question also because I mean, the, this having having this uh, statement in terms of deforming by a Mora Kartan element would, would somehow also give uh, a description of the product on the deformed complex in terms of the uh, operations on symplectic cochains. So somehow it'd be uh, sort of what, what you expect, uh, taking a pair of pants product, but then you sort of have a bunch of cylinders coming out and, and you need to plug caps in, into them, but that, that's not what we end up proving. Okay, so this is the statement. Um, maybe I can, all right. So, so here's an example that illustrates parts B and C of the theorem. Um, Take X to be a, a smooth uh, Fano toric variety and, uh, and D to be the toric boundary divisor. So, in, in this case, we can take kappa equal to lambda or all, all lambda i equal to one and kappa equal to one as well. And this is. So kappa is greater than zero, tick. Lambda i are all greater than zero, tick. And kappa lambda i less than or equal to one, tick. So all of our hypotheses are satisfied here. We can write down the symplectic cohomology of the complement, the divisor, which is symplectic cohomology of C star to the N. So that looks like a uh, Laurent polynomial ring, that's this bit here, together with an exterior algebra. So this is the bit that looks like the cohomology of the torus. Uh, these del, del zi anti-commute with each other, the zi commute. So, so we get something that looks like a Laurent polynomial ring together with an exterior algebra. 
And in this case, so, so that's the E1 page of our spectral sequence is this symplectic cohomology. And in this case, uh, a result of Tonkinog allows us to determine what this class beta is that describes the differential on the E1 page. Basically says it's exactly given by the, um, the disk potential counting Maslov index to disks uh, with boundary on the monotone Lagrangian torus fiber. So that lives inside this Laurent polynomial ring, which sits inside the symplectic cohomology. So when you compute the, the E2 page, so you take the cohomology of Lie bracket with this beta, uh, you get precisely the Jacobian of this disk potential W, and that is precisely the quantum cohomology. So in fact, the spectral sequence collapses at that page, at the E2 page. Okay. Now, I also want to uh, talk about the, so, so there, there's an additional theorem, which is guaranteed by the same hypotheses. And this is an extension of work of Tonkinog and Beryl Gunas in, in the case kappa equals zero. And this concerns the uh, skeleton S lambda of the complement of the divisor with respect to the Liouville structure beta lambda. So this is, so, so, so lambda sort of determined a Liouville structure, a, a, a primitive for the symplectic symplectic form omega up to adding exact things. So it places, so, so it's not the case that theta lambda is uniquely determined by lambda, but it is the case that lambda, that there's a compatibility between them and lambda places restrictions on theta lambda. So, so that's why I'm putting lambda in the notation like that. So, so this result is about the skeleton S lambda with respect to uh, the Louisville structure, the Louisville primitive uh, theta lambda. And this says that under the same hypotheses, the skeleton is SH full. So here's what that means in terms of relative symplectic cohomology which I'm about to introduce, but haven't introduced yet. Um, but already before introducing it, I'm, I can tell you some com consequences of this statement. It, it's, it, it's, so Tonkinog and Beryl Gunas compare it with the, the um, super heaviness as defined by Entov and Polterovich. Uh, so consequences include that this, skeleton is not stably displaceable in X, uh, and also that it intersects any Fleur theoretically essential Lagrangian, so any Lagrangian with non-zero Fleur cohomology um, has to intersect this skeleton. So for example, you can see this in the simplest case that X is a two sphere, D is a collection of points, so, so we need at least two points. We can take kappa to be equal to one and then kappa lambda i, which is, so, so this hypothesis three, said kappa lambda i should be at most one for all i. So this kappa lambda i is equal to the area enclosing the ith point in our divisor. So the sum of all, and the sum of all those areas is two. 
So hypothesis three says that all of those disks enclosing the components of our divisor should have area at most one. And you can very easily see that this skeleton is going to be displaceable in X if and only if this hypothesis three is satisfied. I, I don't know if it's helpful for me to also. Sorry, Nick, I, I'm probably just, just confused. I, I thought the conclusion was that it was not displaceable. Yeah, you're right. Um, thank you. S lambda is, is non-displaceable if and only if this hypothesis three is satisfied. Thank you. Okay, so one, one thing that's nice about this result uh, is that this, I mean, this, this statement depends more sensitively on lambda. As you can see, I mean, we could, um, you know, we, we could change lambda. It like if we change lambda a little, nothing in here, nothing in this in this theorem really kind of depends on lambda. Like, you know, one, I mean, x minus d. I mean, we've got different Louisville structures, but they're all deformation equivalent. So they're all going to give the same symplectic cohomology. They're all like, as far as this theorem is concerned, it doesn't really matter exactly what lambda is so long as one exists. But this one really depends on which lambda you choose. And it, and it has these, uh, these strong implications for the skeleton. So there's, there's actually another example uh, which is from the previous slide. So if, if we draw the, the moment polytope, then for an appropriate um, choice of theta lambda, this S lambda is is going to be the precisely the the unique monotone Lagrangian torus fiber. That's going to be our skeleton, and and we we know that that is non-displaceable, etc. If we changed to a different lambda, it would have the effect of moving this skeleton. to be a different Lagrangian torus fiber. And it would also mean, so it's a sum of kappa lambda i is gonna be sum of kappa lambda i prime So as soon as we change, change lambda to something different, this hypothesis three is going to be violated. Like the, cause the sum of them all is, uh, is constant and kappa lambda i is exactly equal to one in this case, for all i, as soon as we change them, keeping the sum the same, we're going to force this hypothesis three to be to not be satisfied. And correspondingly, we're going to see the skeleton moving to one of the other Lagrangian torus fibers, which can, in many cases, be displaced by probes. So we know that it's non-displaceable. So that's that's another sense in which this uh, this theorem kind of shows a bit more precisely what the role of this hypothesis three is.
Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about proofs. So first I need to establish some conventions because we, we use slightly different conventions from the usual relative, the way things have been done for relative symplectic cohomology. So we're going to use the, the conventions where generators of flow cohomology are all, all that's equipped with a cap. So a cap is a surface bounding our orbit of our Hamiltonian. Associated to it, we have an index and an action, defined like this. And the degree j part of Fleur cochain complex is sums of capped orbits of index j, whose action goes to infinity. And this is a graded lambda a graded module over the Novikov ring. I, I'm slightly brushing something under the carpet here. I'm I'm saying, uh, assuming that the map from, uh, assuming there's a class whose symplectic area is one. But let me brush that under the carpet. Um, so we get this uh, this lambda module graded lambda module. Uh, with an action filtration. All right, so that's all standard, but just want to establish conventions. And then we have this uh, relative symplectic cohomology as studied recently by Varel Gunas, McLean, Groman. And this says, suppose we've got some compact subset K of X so we choose some co-final family of Hamiltonians among those which are negative on, oops, that was supposed to be K. Which are negative on K. And then we define the sort of preliminary version of relative symplectic cohomology to be some co-chain level direct limit of these flow Cochain complexes with the continuation maps. Excuse, excuse me, Nick. Yes. In the in the previous slide, your map Q could have, could have genus. Yes. So use the surface. Yes. And that's important, I guess. Uh, no. The. <laughs> Unless you're about to tell me it is. Um, I don't think so. I, I know that usually it's taken as, uh, as, as a disk, but... Um, yes, usually it's a disk, so I just wonder why you're taking a surface, but okay. I, we can discuss well, that later. We can uh, discuss so, that so later. I, I guess it's, it's, I mean, one could equally... Uh, define this over, I mean, th this would be the version where you could, like, like you could define your Novikov ring by, by a similar sort of. Go, go ahead, we can continue, that's, that's okay. I all guess right. that's not a crucial point anyway. So. No, no, it's not, it's not at all crucial. Um, Okay, so the we define this preliminary version of the relative symplectic cohomology, which is this direct limit. But each map in this direct limit is a quasi-isomorphism. The cohomology is just flow cohomology of X. But then the crucial thing we do is we take the completion of this filtered complex with respect to the action filtration, degree-wise completion. So there are, so Varel Gunas has proven a Maya via Torres property. But by the way, let, let me like confess at this point that, that this is the bit where we, we really messed up the, the first time and, and what explained to us that we had messed up. We, we thought taking this completion didn't do anything. Obviously that's the whole point of Umut's work. It very much does do something. Um, okay, so, so we apply uh, Varel Gunas's Maya via Torres sequence um, to the decomposition of X into a, a Louisville domain and some small neighborhood of our divisor. 
And then because the divisor is stably displaceable, this Maya Viatora sequence tells us that the Fleur cohomology of X is isomorphic to the relative symplectic cohomology of this Buville domain K. So here's a picture. K is, goes all the way out to the divisor. And we have a decomposition. We choose our H so that the orbits either live in K and correspond to symplectic cohomology generators, or they live all the way up here on D. So we have a decomposition of our relative symplectic cochain complex, but it's there, there can be differentials going in both directions. And the next thing we do is called the contact Fukaya trick due to Tonkinog and Varolgunas. We retract our Louisville domain K down onto the skeleton S. And we correspondingly, uh, we carry these Hamiltonians that we use to define the relative symplectic cohomology of K along with the Louisville flow. So given this, this Hamiltonian HK, we pull it back by the reverse Louisville flow that contracts K down onto a small neighborhood of the skeleton. And then we extend it so that it just looks linear along this, this neck. And near the divisor, it's just going to look exactly like HK, but with some big constant added to it. So the contact for Kaya trick is about choosing your almost complex structure cleverly so that this preliminary relative symplectic cochain complex actually looks exactly, it is isomorphic to the uh, preliminary sim symplectic, relative symplectic cochain complex for the for S. So it's, I mean, it's really like the orbits just get carried along, the the cylinders get carried along, there's an, an identification of generators and every moduli space that defines the different, rough, roughly speaking. However, this procedure changes the action filtration. So in general, these are not the same complex after we take the completion, because we're taking the completion with respect to two different filtrations. But here's where the, 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 the action happens, so to speak. Um, our hypotheses guarantee that these two action filtrations, which a priori might be different, are actually topologically equivalent. So here's, here's how that comes in. It's, it's fix an index for our capped orbits, gamma k uk, then the K action, the action with respect to the big Louisville domain, goes to plus infinity if and only if the S action, the action with respect to the skeleton, also goes to plus infinity. So this is precisely the condition. that guarantees that these completed complexes are actually identical. The, the completion procedures do the same, like add the same infinite sums to both of these complexes. And in particular, they have the same symplectic cohomology, relative symplectic cohomology. I thought this wasn't completion. I beg your pardon? Sorry. I thought you said this wasn't this was true before completion, but I, I but change it, I missed something here. 
so I said the contact for Kaya trick guarantees that they are the same complex before completion. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. But in order to conclude that they're the same complex after completion, you need the action filtrations to be topologically equivalent. You don't need them to be the same. Okay, okay, sure. And but you have that now. So this last inequality is wrong then. They are actually the same. Yes. In in, in general, they need not be the same, but our hypotheses guarantee that they are the same. Okay, so I mean the the reason I mean this implication here is just saying that the completion of a of the of a complex with respect to a filtration just means you allow infinite sums so long as the terms get higher and higher in the filtration. So as long as the notion of terms get higher and higher in the filtration is the same for the two filtrations, the two completions are the same. So, so the proof actually looks slightly different in the case kappa equals zero and kappa positive. So in the case kappa equals zero, this is guaranteed by the condition McLean calls index boundedness. Um, in the case kappa positive, it's a bit different. So since that's the new one, that's the one I'll explain here. So we use the fact that every orbit gamma has what we call a small cap. So what this is saying is if you've got an orbit that winds around some components of the divisors, then you can choose a, a small disk bounding that orbit which passes through the divisors. So in particular, its intersection number with divisor di is up to a sign the number of times it wraps around the I. And then we compute the, uh, the K action of a capped orbit. It's, I mean, we, you know, we, sorry, maybe these just end up looking like formulae. I, I don't, maybe they're not very revealing. Sorry if that's the case, but. Um, we have an approximate formula for this action with respect to the, the big Louisville domain, which looks like this. And the action with respect to the skeleton looks like this. We've lost the part that involved U gamma. And in particular, as U gamma dot D lambda Can be written like this, where the lambda i are positive, u gamma dot di are non-positive. This whole thing is less than or equal to zero, which is what gives this equality here. So that establishes one implication. If if a k goes to infinity, then a s has to go to infinity because it's bigger than a k. In the other direction. We use the, the fact that the, the index is fixed. So this is because we're using these degree-wise completions. And we get some formula for the index where this big first part is secretly the formula for the index of gamma in the symplectic cohomology of x minus d, which, as I mentioned before, is non-negative. That's guaranteed by our hypothesis three, exactly because kappa lambda i less than or equal to one is exactly saying that this factor appearing here is um, less than or equal to zero. 
So, so, so this this whole term is is the the degree of gamma as a generator of symplectic cohomology. And then we have another term, which similarly uh, to above is uh, well, it's non-negative, and that allows us to show that it's greater than or equal to two kappa times a s. And since kappa is positive, this actually gives us an upper bound on a s. So the reverse implication holds because the hypothesis is null. A s can't go to plus infinity while the index is bounded. Can I ask another question? Yep. Um, let's say, uh, take a sphere and take out two points. Yep. I suppose they failed this assumption from the lemma. Right. Of, of which lemma? Uh, the lemma on board now. Is, SH is equal to SH. Uh, no, th this one satisfies this one satisfies our hypotheses, so it satisfies this I lemma. But I, I thought it was like uh, I thought some somehow skeleton gives this rigid analytic circle, whereas larger. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just completely misunderstanding what's happening. Misunderstanding what's happening here. So K contains skeleton as well, right? K is just the uh, yes. Okay, and I I I, I thought. If you consider, for instance, GM, different size of N would give different completions, like different. That is correct. Um, sorry. So, I mean. I think it's about the, the index being not fixed. Sorry, I, I know what you're referring to. I'm not sure how to answer precisely how it um, relates to what I'm doing here. Sorry. Okay. But we could talk. talk. Yeah, the last thing you said seemed to say that AS gamma couldn't go to infinity and therefore it means the completions are vacuous. So nothing is happening. Uh, yes, yes, that's that's another way of saying it. Um, yeah, so we're saying that I of gamma u. Sorry, that would have been a better way of saying it. Yeah, we have an, an upper bound on the on both of the actions when we fix the index. Um, yeah. So in, but you can see why we need kappa positive here. Okay, I think. I think I'm basically out of time. So um, maybe I can give a, a very quick look at um, how we throw out orbits on D, which is that we prove, uh, uh, we give an estimate for this certain combination of index and action for the orbits that show up on the divisor. And then we construct this filtration F so that the degree truncated filtration that appeared, appeared in our main statement does not include any of these orbits on D by this estimate. Um, and you can think about the case of S2 with the divisor of point, which doesn't satisfy our hypotheses and you can see very explicitly what goes wrong, that these S and K filtrations are different. One of them is trivial, the other one is not. And this 
makes one of them give rise to the so sh of x of k gives rise to the correct um to, to the is equal to the flow cohomology of x and sh x of s is not due to this completion um and uh, that's a quick overview of what was what was left to talk about but i think i should stop there thank you okay thank you very much nick uh So, um, any questions? Uh, I see maybe on the chat a question from Egor. I think you, I thought you clarified that, but maybe Egor wants to ask something more precise. It, it might have showed up before. Yeah. Uh, I, I clarified it. So, uh, Marco has a question, but he's going to ask it. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank, thank you for the talk. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask um, the following question. So there are, there are some situations in, in mirror symmetry, especially, I think, where uh, you would like a theorem like yours, but for a, a divisor that is given and it's not necessarily uh, normal crossing. Um, and, and something you can do to, to apply your theorem is to um, take, uh, I think the, the right term is a lot resolution. So resolution, uh, even though your, your space is smooth, you, you anyway take a resolution that resolves the divisor to be simple normal crossing. Uh, and the, the problem with that is that uh, essentially, you are. I think in your terminology, you are changing the lambda i's essentially, be because the new simple normal crossing divisor will have uh, will be supported on the original one plus some uh, log discrepancies times the exceptional locus. So some numbers, uh, some combination, some some divisor supported on the exceptional locus of, of the resolution. And so I wanted to ask essentially, uh, I, don't, I don't understand well your, con your third condition, kappa uh, lambda i uh, in most one, I don't, I don't have a good intuition, but do you think that would impose some constraints on, on these discrepancies uh, for, for this strategy to work? Or, or more in general, do, do you know if there is any relation between these lambda i's uh, and, and log discrepancies? I, I would expect the answer to that is yes. Um, but uh, but I, I, I mean, I, I don't know how, how to um, say it. I, I don't know what the correct way of saying it is. Um, I mean, Yeah, uh, it's like okay. it, it sounds good to me, but I but I don't have anything precise to say. That's it. Okay. So you and you need uh, ju just uh, maybe a bit more uh, precise. You, you need this assumption uh, of a normal crossing uh, essentially to have this uh, log PSS map. Is that why? Uh, or, or to have a, a good understanding of the orbits uh, close to the boundaries, that why you need this assumption? Yes, we, we need um, we need to have a, a to be able to define these specific Hamiltonians that we use. Um, so, so these, these, I mean, these estimates on the action and index, or the, the, I mean, these approximations to the action and equalities for the index, and then the, these uh, estimates on index and action for things on the divisor, these all depend <laughs> on a specific choice of Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. which is defined using the 
the fact that your divisor is normal crossings. I mean, you use a result of McLean, which shows that you can deform it so that it becomes orthogonal normal crossings okay. and you have some kind of, uh, he calls a regularization, like a normal form mm -hmm. uh, around that, around the divisor. And uh, you use this to construct Hamiltonians with precisely the, the index and action that you need for the argument to work. So yeah, the, you wouldn't be able to do it. it. Like if you had an example like you're considering where the divisor is singular, you, you would need to choose some resolution as you're mm -hmm. describing first before you could run any of this argument. Okay, thank you. In its current form, I guess. Okay, um, so let's see if there are any other questions. Maybe uh, um, question that my previous question was somehow answered, but this endless question, but I still feel it. And the reason I was asking that is because you claim is equal after completion. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was true, but you know, I think more than most people were saying things like, you know, this this large thing is I I don't know. It, it, the this large thing should be a larger annulus, whereas when you contract it close to the skeleton, it should be the completion should correspond to some smaller annulus. So, I mean, after completion, I thought this, they wouldn't be. Yeah, okay. So now that I think, think more about it, I think the difference must be that for that story, you need to use a like a, a Z mod two grading and you're taking like Z mod two graded completions. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, you can have a, a sum of like an infinite sum of powers of the Novikov variable Q appearing in your coefficient ring um, because they are, uh, you know, they, they all have the same degree mod two. Whereas in the version we're using, Q has degree two kappa. So such an infinite sum can't appear. Because the the kind the the completed ring you're talking about, like the analytic functions on an anal annulus of a certain size. Like the, they the, I, they I mean the Z to the I functions they all have degree zero in the cylinder, but the, the Novikov variable, the, the Q to the Q to the A, the, these terms are all gonna have, like, like you're gonna need an infinite sum involving infinitely many powers of Q uh, to, to get this, these functions on, on, the, on the annulus. So, so you, you like you, you can only get it, it's only going to work if you make Q not have a, have a grading, but it's crucial to our setup that, that we do incorporate the grading in that way. So there is a question from Oleg on the chat. Uh, so he says, uh, so Oleg, do you want to ask a question? Uh, sure, yeah, I'll ask the question. Uh, hi, Nick. Um, hi. I'm just wondering if uh, there's any kind of hope of proving a version of your result for Fukai categories going from Fukai category of the complement of the divisor to the whole thing. Um, like. To, to do that, I guess you would want closed exact Lagrangians in X minus D. Yeah. And yeah. Um, under your assumptions, does that, that, that seems to hold in some cases. Do you have yeah. reason to believe? Um, 
such a yeah, protection yeah. would hold there. Yeah, you, yes, your, your question gives me the opportunity to, to, to sort of jump off the deep end and, and speculate because um, so, so certainly, as you say, when we have closed exact Lagrangians, we can, the, the Fakaya category in X is some kind of uh, deformation of the Fakaya category of X minus D for exactly the kinds of reasons we're talking about here. You know, one counts curves in the complement of D and then one counts curves passing through D. Um, so, so it's kind of immediate when your objects are closed Lagrangians in the complement of D that you have such a deformation. And you should, I mean, in the L infinity version of the statement that I uh, mentioned that you know, is not what we proved, but which we believe should be true. You have some Mori Katana element in symplectic cochains, and that describes how the deformation that gives you quantum cohomology looks. And you can, you have the closed open map to the Hochschild cohomology of the Fagaya category, and you can push forward this Mori Katana element to get a deformation of the Hochschild cohomology of the Fagaya category. And, and that is, the same deformation that we're talking about, as you would expect. Um, uh, but it's it's an interesting question to, well, it's an interesting to observe that you can also push this Morikatan element forward to the Hochschild cochains on the wrapped Fukaya category and get some deformation of the wrapped Fukaya category, which does not have such a um, natural geometric interpretation because you've got some non-compact Lagrangians going out to the divisor and it's not clear how they correspond to objects of the Fukaya category of X. Nevertheless, there, there should be this formal object, the, the deformed wrapped Fukaya category. And um, it's, it's intriguing to imagine like whether you might be able to to find some better version of the Fagaya category by kind of putting all these things together for all possible choices of divisor and getting some, some kind of Fagaya category of a symplectic manifold that, you know, doesn't have this problem that you never know if like a priori of your Fagaya category might not have any interesting objects. Like, the, you know, it's sort of like you, whenever you take a divisor out, you've always got interesting Lagrangians and you, you've always got a, an interesting category. So, I don't know, there, there's some very speculative idea of hooking up a better version of the Fukaya category by cooking, putting together all these deformed wrapped Fukaya categories. Um, but in answer to the original question about the closed Lagrangians, the, I mean, it, yes, it, it fits very naturally into the, the setup that I was talking but, about. Uh, but uh, Nick, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in this case, you would have some uh, Lagrangians in the divisor too, or not, right, in principle, that you could lift maybe by uh, in the normal, so you'd, you'd have some parts that probably come from the divisor, right, in, the, in this category. So you have things in the complement, but you might also have some things that are that maybe are related to things in the Lagrangians through some uh, lift, right? In uh, yeah. like, I don't know, a circle bundle or something over the things in. Yep, yeah, I mean, th those would be, yeah, certainly also objects like this would right. be, yeah. All right, so uh, uh, maybe other questions? Could I? My question again, please. So, could you please sh 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 show the definition of um, Varal Luna's uh, relative symplectic homology? So, uh -huh. so, so, so it is defined as homology of this pre? It's it's the cohomology of um, of this one. Mm 
Oh, okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's the cohomology of the completed one. Because the, the cohomology of this one is just the cohomology of X. It's just flow cohomology of X. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Aha, aha. Okay, okay, Th thank you. N now I understand. So, so after you have isomorphism on the pre, you also need to upgrade it to the completion because that's how you get Veraldenus uh, homology. Correct. All right, thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't answer the, your question before. Sorry. Um, all right, so um, uh, the questions. So I think we still have some quite uh, some time. If um, so in the meanwhile, maybe people think of more questions, but in the meanwhile, Nick, uh, please send me your slides after your talk so uh, oh. I can post them. And um, okay. Um, so what was, um, um, so I remember that I heard you talk about uh, this work uh, when it was with uh, Strom, maybe or part of it. No, I, I, I haven't given a talk about this before, no. Um, hmm. But you were saying that the work started with work, uh, you know, you started just working with uh, Strom and- Yes, that's right. Or maybe did, maybe I heard him talking about, but there was something yeah, yeah. That sounded not far from, I mean, it wasn't this, but it was- that, That's right, yeah, yeah. So Strom, okay, I, I, Strom and I had, uh, Strom gave several talks about our work in progress um, <laughs> several years ago, and it, it was not precisely this result we were. It was about the L infinity refinement of right. the first theorem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So I, I just wanted to clarify where, how, how they fit. 